Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You can have our hearts, Lord. Church, just put your hand on your heart and just say, God, you, you have all of my heart. You have all of it. Today, would you open wide your heart? Open wide to receive God's love today. Life's just too difficult. This Christian walk is just too difficult unless you're in love with God. Otherwise, it's, it's a slog. Unless you can experience and, in, and embrace the love of God, you're going to do things out of obligation and duty rather than out of desire and out of a love relationship for our King. You know, when you came to Christ, the two became one. So intimate. He put His Spirit in you. And He wants you to remain in Him, to abide in Him, to live in Him. That it would be the highest form of intimacy. Like with a husband and a wife, when they have sex together, the two become one. That God and, and you would become one intimately. One, one being. Him in you and you in Him. His deepest desire is that you would know Him. His deepest desire is that you would have a relationship with Him. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you set it up this way. We thank you, Lord, that, Lord, all that you require of us is, is love, to love you with all that we have, to love others the way that Jesus Christ loved. And we will remain in that love. We'll remain in that love relationship with you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Make that such a deep reality in our hearts today. Make that such a deep reality. To know the love of God. My prayer, like Paul prayed, the Apostle Paul, he says, I pray that you would be strengthened in your inner being. That you would become enlightened <laughs> to, the, to the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of God's love for you. And not only would you be able to get your head around it through the power of the Holy Spirit, but you would encounter it and that you would know the love of God. You would know it. You would know it. You wouldn't just be able to read about it. You wouldn't just be able to think, oh, yes, God does love me. No, you would know that you know that you know that you're loved by God. Lord, it's my prayer that not one person would leave this place not having encountered your love. Holy Spirit, come. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and goodness and self-control. Holy Spirit, come and fill these people with your love and your joy and your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. How are you this morning? Uh, our God is good, isn't he? Always. You know the one thing about the difference between our church and an African church? They've got a pulse. No, just kidding. <laughs> last, last week, I, I spoke on um, the parable of the prodigal son. And if, if you haven't heard it, I just encourage you to gra grab hold of it and listen to it. Just the, the concept that and the, and the actual experience that you can have of God coming into your life and loving you so well. And so many people, 
attend churches, attend church services, but they never experience God's love for themselves. It's not a reality to them. And we read that in the story of the parable son. The parable. <laughs> we, we read that in the parable of the prodigal son. The older son lived in the father's household all that time. And the father represents God. And we see the heart of God. We see him, the lengths that he went to, to show unconditional love to his son. And he allows the son to run away. He allows the son to spend everything freely because he wants him not on, he doesn't want his performance, he wants his heart. He wants him to come back to him, to experience and encounter him. And the older son lived in the same house as that father and yet did not know the love of the father. I got four siblings. My father recently passed away. And each of us kids had a different relationship with our father. Each of us. For me... God, he, he, would, he, he just was just an amazing father. For others, you know, they had other things. Like they had stuff that they, you know, they didn't have that view of dad that I had. Same person, I believe, showed those same qualities. But you can live in the same household and have a different perspective of the same person. And I want to say to you, that's the same with God. That older, older son, he says, I've served you all, these da all the days of my life. And you haven't done this for me. He had the heart of a servant when he was a son. Don't get me wrong, Jesus says we've got to come low like a servant, but we're not servants. We, we, we serve other people, we come low, and if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to, you've got to come low and serve people. But when your relationship with Christ, man, if that's based in servanthood, you, you're going to see God in a way that you shouldn't see him. But he's judge. And ultimately, Jesus will judge the world. But if you're a Christian, man, we, that judgment passes over us. So why would we necessarily put ourselves under a legal system when we, when we don't have to? In fact, Jesus says, look, if you put yourself, or I think it's the Apostle Paul, says if you put yourself under the law, then you've got to obey every one of the, the laws. So we're, we're children of God. We're we're his beloved children, and he loves us so dearly. And we've got to begin to see ourselves in that loving relationship because if we don't, what's going to happen is we're going to perform for God rather than just be his son or his daughter and have such a beautiful, loving relationship. You know, he, he came, he came that we might know him. He came that we would be reconciled to him. He came that we could have a relationship with him. He didn't just come so that we could read about him in a book. He didn't just come so that we could pray to something that we don't encounter. He came to show us what God is like and to make a way that we could have an intimate relationship with the Heavenly Father. That was his purpose right from the very start. Even at the time when the law is being given, after the law has been given, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we read that Moses is given the Ten Commandments by, G, uh, by, by God. The very next chapter, he says, you, that, that's the detail, but I want to give you the substance. I want to give you how you can, what, what I want from you. He says, I want you to love me with all that you are, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. I want you to love me in that way, with all your heart. I, I want your heart. 
And the Ten Commandments, I believe, are there to show us how we can keep our heart for the Lord. Like he, he says, like, he wants us just to have this pure heart toward him. And then you, you go, oh, my goodness. If that's the case, if God just wants my heart, it's so easy to respond that way. In fact, you know, like, um, I think my dad taught me so much just in who he was. Like, he was such a good dad, and I loved him so much that the thought of disobeying him was just so foreign to me. I didn't think about, oh, you know, I, I disobey him. I didn't fe feel like there was any challenge. I just naturally did the right thing because of who he was. I never questioned, you know, his veracity, the truth, the, his, his integrity behind anything he said. I just knew it. And I think when we get to that place of knowing, it takes the striving out of it. When we know the love of God. I've, I've preached this, that the form, highest form of love is agape love. This love of unconditional love from the Father to, to mankind. Uh, and I, I want to I sort of retract that. And I want to say agape love is amazing love. We, we love it so much that we call Emily's dog agape. It, it's the unconditional love that God has for all of mankind. And we're called to love that in that way, the agape love, that unconditional love, that, that love that says, you know what? No matter what you do, when, no matter what you say, I'm going to love you. Uh, you. You know, that, that love that, that goes the extra mile, turns the other cheek. It, it, it prays for those who persecute them. It, 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 it loves the, your enemy. It, it's a love for all people. But what I want to say to you that there's almost like a deeper form of love. Because we're to agape love the world, everyone else like Jesus loved. But there's this thing called brotherly affection, filio love. And this brotherly affection is, is, when, is when you open your heart to me and I open your, my heart to you. And we have this brotherly form of affection. If you've ever been in conflict with, a, with another Christian, you'll know what I mean. That you, you can go from a place of having like this deeper love for someone, a, a, like a brotherly affection for someone. You have conflict. And then at that time of conflict, you sort of withdraw a little bit. You still love the person. You still want the best for them. But, the, but that depth of brotherly affection for them, sometimes if it's deep conflict can cause you to withdraw that filio love. And I, and I want to say to you, God's love, when we open up our heart to him, is deeper. It's a deeper form of love. You know, the, the love that, um, that we have for, our, um, for one another is another Greek word. And... Um, Storage love. It's, it's, it's like this family. This, yeah, I'm seeing some blank looks. I looked it up on storage, S-T-O-R-G-E. It's a familiar love. It's that type of love that, you know, a mother ha might have for their child. So there's these different Greek words that represent the love of God. And I want to say to you, the highest form of love is when we open up our, our hearts and allow someone in and allow God into our life that he gets to know us you know what I mean and we get to know him like we press into him it's like it's like we we want this intimacy and what I the the title of my message is remaining in our first love remaining in our first love in in Revelation chapter 2, it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, I know your works, your labor, your patience, 
and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who say that they are apostles and, are not found, and have not found them liars. And, the, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. That sounds like the tick of approval to me. Like if, if you're a church, you go, whoop, how good is that? God's aware of the works that I'm doing. He's aware of these things that I'm doing. He's aware of, of the fact that I, I'm, not, I'm standing strong on doctrine. He's aware of these things. And then he says this, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And the word there, first, the context of this could, could mean two things. Uh, in the ESV, it says the, the love that you had at first. But I, I believe it's, it's, it's the order that, that we've lost our first love, that, that God is first in our life, that he is number one, one in our life. And regardless of, of whether I'm right or wrong, it doesn't really matter because I think Jesus would bring the same rebuke. He would say that if, if, he's no, if God's no longer number one in your life, then I have that against you. God's always wanted to be number one. And Jesus taught that very, very clearly. He says, like, unless you, you got to love me more than you love your mother, your brother, your child. You got to love God first. He must have first place in your life. And we see the tragic story in a parable of where certain money is given to certain people and they come back and they, one of those people hides the money. And the reason they hide it is because they see that the master is hard and he reaps where he doesn't sow. The others come back with a, with, with a deposit. That parable is again about God. And some people have a, a wrong conviction, a wrong understanding of God. And they can see him as a hard taskmaster. And the way that we see God will, will determine the way that we respond to him. So I want to say to you that God loves you unconditionally. He loves you regardless of whether you ever turn to him. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I can tell you now God will love you to the, to the very end. He has a, a passionate love for you, for the whole world, regardless of what you've done. And it says that love never fails, love never gives up. He never gives up on you. He is always going after you. He always wants you. That's the highest form of love. We can, you know, we can um, treat him so poorly and, and yet, curse him and yet he still loves us how undeserving are we of that love but God loves you that way he doesn't want you to stay away from him he wants you and it's the goodness of God that leads us into repentance it's that goodness that will lead us into him so the question I have for you have you lost your first love you know, when you first became a Christian and when God was number one and everything was fresh <laughs> and all you wanted to do was spend time with God and that he had number one position in your life, is that still your reality? Have you shifted from that point? In Revelation 2.5, it says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I believe the first works isn't, okay, I've got to read the Bible, pray, do all those things. Yes, that's probably what you did at first, but your desire was to love him. In, in, um, so the first, uh, what I believe is the first works 
what you did at first is that we give God everything. Jesus said, Jesus was asked, you know, what, what's, the, what's the number one command? And he says this, the first of all the commandments, the first, the most important, the greatest is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he's quoting from um, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, yeah, chapter 6. And he says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. I believe they sum up, well, the Bible says so, <laughs> that they sum up all the law. They sum up all of what the prophets spoke about. The heart and soul of, of, of what's required of man is, is captured in, those, in, that, in that, those couple of verses. What God wants of you is just your heart. He wants you. He wants to get to know you. He doesn't want your religious duty. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants you to open up your heart. He wants you to share from the depth of your heart. He wants you to, you know, the, the, the areas of your, your life that you may not have given him. He wants those parts. He wants every part of you. He doesn't want to leave anything behind. He wants it all. You know, we... We can sometimes be like a, some Christians can be like a chameleon. They just blend into their environment. So here at church, you, whoop. Um, but then you, you move into other areas and you're like almost a different person. And, and God's saying, I want those parts. I want those areas that don't bring me honor and glory. I want you to surrender those parts. I want you to give them to me. That's the first, that's the greatest. You, 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 you do all of those and you fulfill all of the law. But we're not under the law. And so Jesus, Jesus gives us a, another command. His command is to love other people the way that he loved. So if you want to remain in his love, the very first thing is to give, it, to give God your heart, to open up your heart, to allow him to have full and open access and begin to, to pour out your love and affection to him. The second thing is keep yourself from other lovers. Like I said, the Old Testament, you know, Ten Commandments, the, the essence of, the essence of what God wanted for them was to that they would love him with everything that they were. And by loving them with everything that they were, they would obey what he said. You know, I, I had heard one pastor preach, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and live as you please. Because truly, if you love God with everything, you're going to obey him. And he, he sets up the Ten Commandments because he realizes, I believe, he wants us to understand how we can keep our heart pure to him. How we can keep it number one. How he is number one in our life. Because he, he starts off, you shall have no other gods. And you, you shall not make an idol for yourself. You, you shall not covet. Like, in other words, be jealous or, or envious or desire what someone else has. It's like giving your health to something else. Do not commit adultery like you're giving your heart to someone else. Like, I, I, want, you, I want you for me. And I believe that it... If you, if you get this, if you get what I'm trying to, to convey, I, I feel like your Christian walk becomes so much easier and it becomes intimate 
and it's not about trying to avoid sin anymore. It, it, it's like sin's, there, there's no consciousness of sin. Like, sure, you do the wrong thing and you confess your sin, but your focus and attention isn't on that. Your focus and attention is on God. And when your focus and attention is on God, you walk right, you live right. And everything's not a chore, it's a, it's a delight. So we're going to keep ourselves from other lovers. This is what James has to say. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do you know they come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? He's speaking about Christians. He says, you lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot ob obtain. They, they're giving their hearts to other things. They're pursuing other things. They're going after these pleasures. And then he says, you murder and you covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask, you you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And then he goes, he says this, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I want you to get this. You know, what he's saying is you're giving your heart over to other things. The issue is the heart. The issue is you, you want these things, your pleasures, your desires, and you're, you're, you're making friendship with the world. And what it does, it estranges us from God. God will always love us. It's not us that's moving away. It's not, sorry, it's not God moving away from us. It's us moving away from God. God is always there. He's ready. He's like the, the prodigal father waiting Yep, there, I know my son. I know the way he walks. That's him. Boom. Or do you think the scripture says in vain that the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? You've got a Holy Spirit that lives within you. And his deepest desire is that you would, you would set and fix your attention on God that you would give him your affection. The, third, the second point is, set your mind on what the Spirit desires. So you want to remain in the love of God? The first, first, if I could sum it up, is you give your affection to God. You give him your whole heart. You give him your, the best. You give him first place in your life. And then you, you remain in that place. You, 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 you seek to um, not to, to go after any other lover, but to love him and him alone. When you begin to see things like this, wow, when I pursue the things of this world, what I'm actually doing is, is I'm cheating on my, <laughs> on my bride. I'm cheating. I, I, I'm like, committing adultery with this with this thing i'm giving my heart over to something else it was funny um last night i i um i took my grandson to a, a football game and he absolutely loved it um and uh at you know i, I was part way through it and i'm yelling out and i'm a a keen shark supporter, and my voice was starting to go, and I thought, I'm not going to be able to preach if I yell anymore. And that was a good thing, because I actually took stock, and I just went, oh, God, it's only a football match. <laughs> and, I, and I just, you know when the presence of God just hits you when you, when you just choose Him? And I just cho chose, God, I just want to enjoy this. I just want to be here. I don't care who wins. I really didn't care, and sharks lost, and I, and to be honest with you, it didn't. What mattered to me was my grandson, and the time that I was spending with him, and I think that just goes to show you that, you know, like something that in the past would have been a lover for me, something that really, you know, like I went after, is no, it's lost its shine. 
not to say that you can't enjoy the football and, and go for your team or whatever, but uh, I love what Paul says. Um, this Paul de Santos, not the Apostle Paul. <laughs> 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 he might be an Apostle, but no, no. But, but, but Paul um, had this um, Tirana, and it was a hotted up Tirana, and he, and he, he just got saved, and, and he, he was taking it along to, um, to the church where he's going, and, and uh, he was still very much uh, loved God, but still a bit of a hoon, and, uh, <laughs> uh, but he, he'd take it there, and he, he felt a bit of judgment, and he, he got alone with God, and God says, I want you to have good stuff. I just don't want the good stuff to have you. And I think that that puts things in priority, right? You know, enjoy the football. Don't let the football, you know, have you. You know what I mean? Um, enjoy, whatever you do, don't have any other lovers. Let, let, let the thing that burns in your heart be, be God. And, and then you, you go, okay, how can I glorify God in what I'm doing? How can I be an example where I'm at? You know, in all that I do, I take God into it. And so where work might be a bit of an idol, you could say, okay, well, God, I, I just give you my workplace. I just want to work like I'm working unto you. I just want to do my best. I just want to be an example there. I want to just shine brightly, and I, I want to start praying for the people in that workplace. I want to begin to, to, to be a witness in that place, whatever it might be. But... But what happens, do you see God has first place? And instead of work being something that drives you, you know, you're driving it. It's like money can be an idol to us. But, but when it loses its hold, <laughs> loses its power over us, it's amazing. It's a tool for us then. You know, like, Paul, like God said to Paul, like, I don't want money to have you. So you set your mind on what the Spirit desires. That's your attention. So we've been speaking about affection. Now we're speaking about attention. So God, we not only give God our affection, but we also give Him our attention. So you set your mind on what the Spirit desires. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind, that carnal way of thinking, rather than a spiritual mind, a mind that, that is focused its attention on God. You know, I can get caught up in slander and gossip and worry and fear and envy and desire and you know all the stuff that's in the world i can get caught up in all of that that's carnal thinking right that'll lead us away from god it causes us to to live not the way that you know the way of the world rather than the way of god but when we when we begin to set our mind on what is good and noble and pleasing you know when we when we give him our attention and our focus it's amazing you can walk according to the spirit if you fill yourself with the wrong stuff that's what you go after whatever you fix your eyes on is what will grow in your life you know this right just think about it. Just think about what you're fixing your eyes on at the moment or you fixed your eyes on in the past. It becomes the center of your focus. It becomes what you're, what you're interested in. I built a prayer pod and all I could think of was what, was, what the next step was going to be. I, a tradesman it must do your head in. I don't know how you ever switch off. Um, like you're constantly thinking of the next thing and how you're going to tackle that job. And well, maybe that's just me. But, but you, you know what I mean? You, you're working things out. You're constantly focused on that thing. 
And that's what gets your attention. But if, if what you did was to focus your attention on God, then he gets, the, he gets your attention. He gets your affection. He's the one that begins to grow in your life. I, I used this example a, a few weeks ago and it helped someone, so I may as well give it another fly. Eh? Like, it, like if, you, if you watch horror movies every day for a month, right, at the exclusion of everything else, would you be a good person to be around? Probably not. You'd probably be angry, You'd probably be, you know, anxious, worried, fearful, all of those things, right? But what about if you, if you devoted yourself to The Chosen, the four episodes or something, and you just binge watch that? Do you get my, my drift? What we set our mind on, our eyes, if our eyes are good, then our whole body will be good, you know? Our, our eyes are like a lamp to our body. So if we want to live right, we've got to begin to look right. What are we looking at? What are we focusing our attention on? The carnal mind is enmity again, makes us an enemy of God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are of the flesh cannot please God. And then finally, yielding to the spirit. And loving well. God set it up in such a way that he's removed our boast. He doesn't want us to be filled up with pride and go, I've done this, I've done this, I'm this, I can overcome sin, I'm doing this, I'm this, I'm blah, blah, blah. He's removed the boast. You cannot do anything that's eternal without him. Right, So the, the key is to understand, hey, I've got to cooperate with God if I want my life to work well. And you've got the Holy Spirit whose job is to conform you to the image of his son. And it's his job, his job to do the work. He does the work within us. He does it. But we've got to cooperate. When we give him our affection and our attention, when we spend time with him that's yielding to him when we get when we get that sinking feeling you shouldn't do this Lionel you go okay I'm not going to do that when you get corrected out of the word of God and you go oh my goodness didn't realize I couldn't live like that you, you say no to sin you 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 go oh my good you you take stock of your life at times you know, you go, oh my goodness, if I continue down this track, this isn't going to be good for me. You, you know, you, you're yielding to what the Holy Spirit is raising up in and you're saying yes to him. And you want to say yes, because it's just like, who wouldn't want to say yes to God, right? Because when you think about it, who else knows life better than God? He created it. He's the one that made it. Do you think he's got the better plan? I met, I've met heaps of people that, that have got a better plan than God. Way better. Just ask them. Like that. But I want to tell you, God's ways work. They always work. They're amazing. You want to be filled with joy and peace and love? Just yield to him. I want to finish with these two verses. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. In other words, remain, remain in that place. It's like this is where you're going to live. This is the place that you live from. Abiding comes from the word abode. We get the word abode from abide, right? Your normal place of abode is the place that you live from. And so he says, I want you to abide. I want you to live in this place, in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've, I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This is what I've been saying the whole long, whole way along. When God's got your heart, 
when God's got your heart, when, when you give him your heart, you're going to obey his command. When we, when we give our heart to other things, over to other things, what happens? We disobey his commands. What happens? Not that God moves from us, we move from God. Anyone who had a sabbatical from God? You know, just time out. I'm just going to take time out from God. <laughs> not, a, not a biblical sabbatical where you actually take time out from ministry or something, but time out from God. There's plenty of people that take time out from God. I can tell you now, their life doesn't get better. It's a whole lot of pain. And that's not because God has moved the moment that you set your heart back to him, it's like, boom. I'm in the zone again, <laughs> isn't it? It's like those that God, God's waiting for us. God's for us. But if we don't keep his commands, what happens is we get estranged from him. And do you want to know what Jesus' command is? He says, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may, be, may remain in you and that, your, and that your joy may be complete or full. I want that. I don't know, but Jesus seemed like a pretty joyful guy. <laughs> and if, if, he, if he says the joy that's in me, I want it to be in you and I want it to be complete, I might want to listen to that. God wants us to be full of joy. He wants us to be full of love. He wants to be full of him. And he is our reward. And then he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This one verse really sums up the 10 commandments that I was referring to. Because when you love like Jesus loved, that agape love, you, you love people so incredibly well that you're not going to steal from them you're not going to steal from you know you're not going to envy them you're going to lift them up you're going to you're not going to speak against them you're going to embrace them you're going to love them so the heart is 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 if we can remain in his love remain in that first love this christian walk isn't a crawl it's not a roller coaster ride. Woo! Good today, bad tomorrow. Oh, no, good, good's high, right? Good, good today, bad tomorrow. Good, bad, good, bad. All determined by circumstances and whether I get offended or whether I get upset or whether the devil just goes, oh, bit of temptation over here. And so my Christian walk goes like this doesn't have to be like that doesn't have to be like that so it doesn't have to be a roller coaster it doesn't have to be a crawl like you feel like you're oppressed constantly it's not to say that you don't go through difficult times and you don't walk through the valley of the shadow of death I'm not making light of really difficult circumstances but i'm saying you, i've known people that never have come out of the valley of the shadow of death in the 25 years they've been a christian and you go Every circumstance becomes a valley of the shadow of death. You know what I mean? Like, instead of going, okay, well, yep, someone's upset with me. I've got to forgive them. I love them. Come here. It's over. There's no valley of the shadow of death. I'm not under the persecution of, you know, the world. No, someone doesn't like me. Yep, I've got to get right with them. Yeah? It doesn't have to be like a crawl. I can tell you, Remain in the love of God and you'll last the distance. You will last the distance. There's coming a time, and it might be in our lifetime, where we will come under persecution, like real persecution. It's a reality. You've seen how dark the world's getting. There is a tribulation. Some people, have, there's different theologies on it all. I won't go into all of it. 
if there is a tribulation, which I believe there will be, that Christians will go through. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. But can I say this? Bring it on. Truly, because after that short period, we're going to, God's going to reign in power. And wouldn't it be amazing that if God gave you the power in the moment to be a, one of the martyrs to, for it's all eternity, you know, that you, you, you get a reward for what you did. How bright are, are Christians going to shine during difficult times, whether it's the tribulation or something else? I, I can tell you now the world's going pretty pretty wacko and Christians are persecuted all over the world, right? And I can say to you right now that it'll come to Australia and I, I want you to be ready. I want you to be ready. If this Christian thing is dependent upon the goodness of God, meaning goodness of God equals I get everything I desire, not too much hardship, it's not going to work. If that's your view of God, then it's not going to work. If you understand that God loves you, wants the best for you, will correct you, will discipline you, will, will prune you, when you, when you get that understanding of God, that he is a good God, that he wants the very best for you, then you're going to be able to last the distance. Because I don't know how you would otherwise. I really don't know how you would otherwise. Many people, you know, just when it speaks of end times, they get depressed. I think we're... we're we're in a, in a culture and in a world where we're conditioned to embrace pleasure and to hate any form of suffering. And the, Jesus says, I want you to embrace suffering because that's going to bring out the perseverance and character, the character you need to last the distance. And it, actually what it's going to do, it's going to develop you it's going to bring our relationship, that is the relationship with God and, and mankind, closer. It's the difficult times that shape you. It's the difficult times that make you who you are. It's, it's in those difficult times. It's when we're weak that we, we, we see the strength of God. And I want to say to you, there's nothing to be fearful of. Just a, an amazing expectation of God's glory.